Well, good evening, everybody. Happy, happy fall. Welcome to another semester of Woods Edge Student Ministry, another semester of STEM News. We're going to have a fabulous, fabulous year. If you are here for the very first time, welcome. My name is Justin. Hi. Welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, here at Woods Edge Student Ministry, we're a family of imperfect people just trying to love Jesus, journey together, and bring hope to our world. And so if you're here for the very first time, we are glad that you are joining us on that mission. Uh, we have some values. I know there's a lot of new seventh graders in here, and if you're maybe here for the very first time... We've got some things that we value that drive everything that we do here at Student Ministry. The first one is this, worship. We value worship. Everybody say worship. Worship. And when I say worship, it is not necessarily just singing songs, but what I mean by that is our, our life devotion to Jesus and our surrender to the Lord and his will for our lives instead of what we want on our own lives. We, we are worshiping the Lord with everything that we have. Our next value is community. We value community so much. And so on Wednesday nights, our main night, we have community groups and we get to dialogue about the word of God together and wrestle through scripture so that we can grow together. And so tonight we're going to journey together in community. Our third value is discipleship. Okay, our goal in student ministry is to make a place where you are actually stretched, where you are actually forced to grow and mature so that you do not depend on me as your pastor, this church as an organization, but you depend on the Lord Jesus and the Lord Jesus only for your sustenance for your life. And you're connected to the vine, like John 15 says, and every good thing that we have in our lives, every fruit that we have that is good comes because we are connected to the vine. Then our last value is mission. Okay, we take this so seriously. We love gathering together. We love this. We love worshiping together. We love praying together. We love seeking the Lord together. We love holding each other accountable. We love encouraging each other. We love spending time together. But we do this so that we can go out and reach our friends that have never experienced what life in Jesus is really like and the hope and the joy and the peace and the fulfillment that they can experience. And so our goal is to come together and journey together and learn how to love Jesus more so that we can bring hope to the world so that we can be on mission and bring as many people into relationship with Jesus as possible so they can experience what we're experiencing. That's who we are. Um, if you're here for the very first time, just a, one little housekeeping thing. Uh, on Wednesday nights, especially, the room gets pretty full. And so just make sure that if you're in the lobby or if you're in here, that we're not against back walls or up in the niches. Uh, it's safety and security stuff that we need you guys in chairs uh, in case there was an emergency. Really appreciate that. Um, okay. Uh, we had an unbelievable summer here in student ministry. Off the charts summer. Um, God did some amazing things. And so we have a video to show you guys of how good God was this summer in our generations ministry, not just in student ministry, but from birth through young adults. Check it out. As I worship your majesty, I worship your
one thing God has taught me this summer is to just go and seek the lost, to be bold for him. Many times when I've served, I've seen that God has used that time to teach me something about him or something about life as he intended it to be. It shows us that even though we may have divisions in language and things that the Lord's message is still spoken. Uh, it might seem difficult or maybe uncomfortable, but he can still do something beautiful with my yes. Give God a round of applause, yeah. Yeah, it is, it is pretty amazing to see what God did this summer, uh, to be a part of it, to experience it, and still know uh, that we're just scratching the surface of how good and how faithful our God is, amen? So I'm excited for this fall. The best is yet to come. Uh, when we follow Jesus, as long as we don't give up, we're always moving forward. And so I am so excited to kick off this fall with a brand new series that we are calling The Thief of Everything. The Thief of Everything. And we are going to talk about comparison. Comparison. Um, you know, I know a little bit about comparison. You see, as, as we launched into the summer, uh, I live in a neighborhood that has a really cool pool. And so my kids like to go to the neighborhood pool. So we load everybody up in the minivan, go minivans, and we drive to the pool one day and we all file out and we're swimming at the pool. And while we're there, you know, I was, I was sitting there and just kind of, looking around and, you know, before I knew it, I was kind of consumed by something. I was focused on something. Do you guys know what I was paying attention to? Dad bods. Dad, dad bods. Okay. This is a safe place, right? Can we, can we all, like, am I okay to just share my business here? Okay. Just want to set the example. Okay. I'm at the public pool. And I find myself and I'm, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm checking out other dad bods and I'm just seeing where I fit in. You know, I'm like, okay. And I look over this way and I'm like, okay, feeling pretty healthy, feeling pretty good. And then I look over this way and I'm like, oh man, Justin, put your shirt back on. Okay. Like that's just, this just reality. <laughs> Here's the thing. Comparison is, is normal, it's natural. We all find ourselves comparing at different points in time. We all struggle with it, right? Like you thought you were strong until someone outlifts you by like 100 pounds. And you thought your fit was just off the charts until you show up at church and someone is just looking a little better, right? You thought your crush was awesome until you met someone else's. I'm um, just saying. <laughs> Too is that too close to home? Is that too honest? Are we, sorry. Oh, Paul. Okay, who? Some people will be like, calm down. Okay, moving on. Okay, this list can go on, right? We can go on and on and on. Different ways that we find ourselves comparing ourselves to someone else. Um, the thing that's crazy is we'll discover that Comparison is not just something that we do, it's actually something that, that steals from us. It's not something that is productive, it's not something that's gonna bring life, but in fact, as it creeps in subtly most of the time, it starts to steal our joy, steal our peace, steal our hope. Psychology Today had an article that says this, according to some studies, as much as 10% of our thoughts involve comparison of some kind. 
Can you believe that? 10% of the things that we think are comparing to other people. Social comparison theory. So like this is such a big deal. There's actually a theory that's named after it. Social comparison theory is the idea that individuals determine their own social, get this, they determine their own social and personal worth based on how they stack up against others. The majority of people spend 10% of their time comparing themselves to other people. And those thoughts tell themselves not just where they rank in society, but their actual worth deep down inside. That, that's how they find it, by comparison. How sad is it that we have given into the idea that we can only find our worth through other people and how we stack up against them. Many of us find ourselves in this trap of comparison. It steals our joy. It steals our peace. It fills us with fear and pride. But many of us have no idea how to do it differently. Like we just go throughout life and we're constantly Competing, constantly comparing, constantly trying to edge other people out so we can have an advantage, so we can make the team, so that I can make the cut, so that this person doesn't get an edge on me. And we just don't know how to do it differently. Thankfully, humans that lived thousands of years before us during uh, the time right after Jesus was on this earth, they wrote down a thing or two about their struggles with comparison. And so today we're going to dig into a passage out of 2 Corinthians. If you've got your Bibles with you, you can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to read it out of NLT. If you've got an NLT version, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And this passage is written by a guy named Paul. Okay, Paul was one of the greatest missionaries of all time, spreading the news of Jesus to people that had never heard it before. One of the greatest of all times. Paul, on one of his missionary journeys, goes to this town called Corinth, and he starts a church in Corinth. He shares the gospel. People say, I believe what you're saying. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again to forgive me of my sins. And because of that, I can now be in right relationship with God. And so I'm going to put my trust in his will for my life. And I'm going to surrender to that instead of doing my own thing. And Paul has all these people that say that they believe that and want to follow Jesus. So he starts this church. And then he leaves to go and start other churches after he kind of gets it established. Well, while he's gone, he hears reports about certain things that are happening in the church in Corinth. And he writes them a letter of correction, telling them, hey, some of the things that you're doing do not align with the, the teachings of Jesus. And we need, to, we need to work on this. We need to hold each other accountable. And so they receive this letter. And after they receive this letter, first of all, they don't really love it, right? They're kind of being called out on some things that they're doing. So the church doesn't really love it. And at the same time, some false teachers come in and start saying, yeah, Paul doesn't really know what he's talking about. Like we actually know more than Paul. We are more apostles than Paul was. And so they start to compare their ministry to Paul's. How many people have they reached? How many people has Paul reached? How many churches have they started? How many churches has Paul started? How many people have gotten saved over here and over here? Like they start to compare and they're like, no, 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 we're better than Paul. So Paul writes another letter to this church in Corinth because he hears of this influence that's happening and he wants to set the record straight. So if you guys would stand with me right now, we stand in honor of God's word. Here at Woods Edge Student Ministry, we believe that the Bible is true. It's not just a work of fiction. It's not a bunch of fairy tales. We believe that it is the word of the living God. And then whenever we read it, he speaks to us and it transforms us. So we stand to honor that. So follow along with me. Second Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 10. For some say... 
Paul's letters are demanding and forceful, but in person he's weak and his speeches are worthless. Remember, this is Paul responding to these accusations. So people have called him demanding and forceful, but only in his letters. Like he's weak in person. He's only, he's only being this bold because he's writing a letter right now. But in person, his speeches are worthless. Those people, this is Paul responding, those people should realize that our actions when we arrive in person will be as forceful as what we say in our letters from far away. Paul's like, hey, don't mess with me. Verse 12, oh, don't worry. We wouldn't dare say that we are as wonderful as these other men who tell you how important they are, but they are only comparing themselves with each other using themselves as the standard of measurement. How ignorant. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for today. God, as we dive into your word, uh, we need you to speak to us. Lord, we need you to transform us. And Lord, ultimately, we wanna be so transformed that we just can't hold in this message and that we see Houston become a city of God. And Lord, we need you desperately. We believe you for it. Speak to us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. So Paul is basically saying, hey, we're all just creating our own standard of comparison. Like this weird arbitrary standard. Like there's really no litmus test. Like everybody just kind of makes up on their own how we compare and what's valuable and what's not valuable. And Paul's like, that just doesn't even make any sense. We're looking at each other and deciding what we think our lives need to look like. And the truth is this, at the root of comparison are things like emotion and perception and personal opinions and personal experiences. So it's impossible to be unbiased when we are comparing between us and someone else. And Paul just calls him out and he says, hey, your standard for how you see your worth and your value in this world, comparing yourself to other people, if that's how you find your value, yeah, that's really dumb. (laughs) That's like what Paul says. He's like, yeah, that's really stupid. It doesn't make any sense. It's not wise. It's not helpful. And a few verses later, Paul tells us to turn our attention elsewhere. In verse 17, it says this, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. When people commend themselves, it doesn't count for much. The important thing is for the Lord to commend them. You see, Paul's saying that we spend our time focusing on other people and how we measure up to them. And it doesn't really matter. Instead, God's encouraging us to turn our focus toward him. That we're not focused on other people and what they are doing. That's why Paul says uh, their standard for measurement is other men. Our standard for measurement is not, you know, am I smarter than that person? Am I, am I, am I more handsome than that person? Am I prettier than that person? Am I more gifted than that person? Am I more charismatic than that person? That's, that's not... Our comparison, our comparison is to to Jesus, like perfect Jesus. Like the smartest people who were walking the earth at the time tried to corner him and outsmart him and get people to turn on him. And it took so long and it only happened when Jesus actually just kind of let them. (laughs) Like that's who we're comparing ourselves to. The one who was perfect enough to be able to die on the cross to take my punishment and your punishment. That's our comparison. And here's the deal. (laughs) If you have put your trust in Jesus, God sees us as beloved children, no matter what. Like he looks at you and all he thinks is love. It has nothing to do with the people around us. The truth is this, God doesn't compare you to others. Like we love to compare ourselves to others, but God has never 
not once compared you to someone else because he created you for a reason, exactly how you are for a purpose. He has a plan that he says is a good plan. He says, it's actually so good. It's beyond what we could even ever ask or think. Like our human minds can't even contain the good plans that he has for us. God's not looking to see how we line up to other people around us. He's not taking away points when we don't maintain this image that we feel like we need to uphold. He just loves you because he loves you. Just, just, just because he loves you. <laughs> you know, the book of Proverbs gives us a good starting point for how to protect ourselves from the thief of comparison. Let's take a look at Proverbs 4, 23. It says, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Of course, the, the Bible, when it refers to our heart, it's not like the literal organ, okay? Like, boom, 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 like that's not guiding your path for your life, okay? But like our passions, our desires, our, our, our heart's desire, what we long for most, those things, that, that's what it's saying. We need to guard our heart, guard it against everything for it determines the course of our life. The truth is comparison starts in our hearts. Comparison starts because we are not grateful. We're not recognizing what God is doing. Instead, we are focused on what maybe we wish God would be doing. And we find ourselves frustrated, we find ourselves hurt, disappointed, and it all starts in our hearts. So if we want to avoid letting ourselves get caught up in the negative parts of comparison, then we have to stop it in the same place, our hearts. We have to guard our hearts. So here are three ways that we can guard our hearts. Three ways that we can guard our hearts. Number one, everybody say number one. one. Pay attention to your feelings. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, how are you feeling? Okay, hey, don't share, don't share. Okay, I just said ask the question. So here's the thing. I want you guys to be able to pay attention to your feelings. Pay attention to your feelings. Notice the way your mood or outlook changes when you start to compare yourself to someone else. See how your day, see how your mood, see how your emotions shift when you catch yourself comparing to someone else. Do you feel disappointed? Do you feel frustrated? Do you feel angry? Do you feel anxious? Do you feel prideful? Shh. Here's the thing. Those feelings will be clues that you're probably caught up in comparison. If you can recognize, man, I'm starting to get a lot of negative emotions. Why? And trying to evaluate that, processing it with the Lord, like we talked about last week. Lord, what's going on with my feelings? And, and if you're like, man, it, I'm, I'm comparing, let, let those emotions help you recognize that. Second thing, everybody say number two. <laughs> Find out what's fueling it. Okay? Find out what is fueling these emotions in this comparison in your life. Uh, Chelsea just recently asked me to install an above ground pool at our house. Um, it was like, it was like one of the worst projects of all time. Okay. Leveling our yard, figuring that out was, was really terrible. Not to mention we're working outside and it's like 145 degrees out and I'm melting and I'm a very pasty ginger. Like it was just all, it was just bad all the way around. And so we're out there and it is so hot. It is so hot. And unfortunately, a lot of times we had to work in like the hottest parts of the day. And so we're out there and I was drinking tons and tons and tons of water, but I started to still feel really sick. And I was confused. I was like, I don't know what's going on. Why am I feeling so sick? I'm drinking plenty of water. I'm trying to rest every once in a while. Why am I feeling so sick? 
Well, Lynn and Liv come over to check on us and make sure that I'm not angry and have destroyed the pool already out of frustration. And uh, when they come over, Liv has electrolyte packets. And so she pours one in a bottle of water and I chug this bottle of water. And within like 10 minutes after being sick for like all afternoon, I feel fabulous. Why? My body didn't have the right fuel and it started to shut down. So I thought what I was getting was actually going to fuel me when in fact it was hurting me. So find out what is fueling this comparison because you need to starve that. You need to starve that thing that is fueling comparison. Just like if you cut off oxygen to a fire, the fire will die. You need to cut off whatever is leading into that. What are you looking at? What are you thinking about? What are you doing when you start to feel those things? Are you just holding on to them and like relishing these, these destructive feelings or are you allowing the Lord to change your perspective and you, you start to see things differently and you, you start to process your emotions in healthy ways and you come to community group and you process that like, what are you doing when you start to, th- to feel those things? And then what's fueling your negative comparisons? If it's something in your control, take a step away from it. Take a step away from it. There are so many things that are within our control, but it, because of society and because what other people do and because it's just a habit for us, like it's hard to let go of things. But the truth is maybe you need to close that app. Maybe you need to set a screen time on your phone. Maybe you need to turn the TV off. Maybe you need to take a break from that friend group for a while. What is fueling that? And that can be, those can be hard decisions. But I promise you, nothing is worth more in your life than intimacy with the Lord. I promise you, if you are willing to sacrifice things that are normal for most people for pursuit of intimacy with the Lord, the Lord will always honor that. He will always honor that. And if it's something that you can't control, that you're dealing with and you're wrestling with and you just don't know why you continue to compare and what's going on, man, That's why we have community groups. We would love for you to talk to one of your group leaders. Talk to them tonight. They can help you identify steps so that you can guard your heart, so that you can grow. They can check in on you. They can encourage you. They can pray for you. They can hold you accountable. Okay, so number one, pay attention to your feelings. Number two, find out what's fueling comparison. And the last thing, celebrate what you do have. Celebrate what you do have. Man, uh, I have a group of friends from Bible college that still stay in touch. It's been 12 years regularly. And anytime one of us starts to complain, we are like parents of toddlers. We will literally, as grown men, shut each other down and go, all right, that's 10 compliments. Full on, like, we'll just be on the phone and be like, man, you were just ragging on your church. Hey, that's 10 compliments. You can say 10 things that you love about your church now. Oh, your job, you're, 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 you're just so hate your job. Okay, you're gonna say 10 things you love about your job. Oh, you're just so frustrated with your kids. Okay, we're gonna say 10 things we love about our kids because it's that powerful. Celebration is that powerful. Gratitude is that powerful. It shifts our perspective. It changes our reality. Celebrate what you do have. And when you're tempted to compare, fill that space in your heart with something better. Fill it with things that remind you of this truth that God doesn't compare you to others. So why in the world would you need to compare yourself to others? He looks at you and you alone. And if you are running after him and you are obedient and you are walking in surrender and you are doing the best that you can, Man, the Lord is going to provide. The Lord's going to give you away. The Lord is going to give you a grace and a mercy and walk with you. Every single one of us struggles with comparison. It's all in different ways, but we all struggle. You know, one of the reasons why community groups exist 
is to give you a place to talk about some of these real things. Some of these things as you become aware of them and these things that you're comparing yourself to and people you're comparing yourself to, uh, and that's what groups are for, to be able to dialogue about that in a healthy way and help each other process. So I hope that as we head into groups here in a minute, that you guys will open up, okay? I challenge you guys, be vulnerable. You know, you're gonna get as much out of community groups as you want, okay? The, the more honest you are, the more, more vulnerable you are, the more engaged you are, the more that you are gonna get out of it. And so as we head into groups, um, first of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray out and then I have a, a couple little housekeeping rules and then we're going to dismiss. Okay. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for tonight. And God, I pray that as we head into groups and we begin to dialogue together about comparison, that God, you would help us to just feel safe. That God, we would know that we are for each other. That God, nothing that we say will be used against us. That God, we can really process. We can really be honest. And God, not to just vent our feelings in an unproductive way, but God, to actually look to scripture and look to truth and continue to challenge and encourage each other to turn our gaze upon you. God, we wouldn't compare. We wouldn't feel the pressure to do what anyone else is doing or what we think is expected of us, but that God, we would rest in what you have called us to do. And that God, I pray that as we go into groups, you would help clarify that for us. Maybe clarify callings, clarify your will in our lives so that God, we can run after you uh, with all of our hearts. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.